Hello, in this video we will look at how a PC boots right up from you turn it on to the time the operating system executes. Now this particular video is especially applicable for Intel and AMD based platforms. So one big thing which we should remember when we are talking about the Intel platforms that we typically use in desktops or laptops is the concept of backward compatibility. So as we have seen in a previous lecture, so Intel maintained backward compatibility. So it ensures even today that any code which was developed on an Intel processor 20 or 30 years back would still execute on the pro an Intel processor uh, used today. So because of backward compatibility, a lot of things that we actually do while loading an operating system would reflect on what was done 30 years back. Essentially, the things what happened in and a system in around 95 or 97, uh, that is when the 386 based processors were used, are still done today on the latest i7 processor from Intel. So we will look at how PC boots. Now we all know that in order to start a computer, we need to press the reset button or the start button present in the desktop. So what actually happens internally is that when you press this button, it is going to send a signal to the CPU. This signal for instance would be a pulse, there is an electrical pulse which gets created when you press the start button or the reset button. And this pulse is sent to a specific pin on the CPU known as the reset pin. And when the CPU obtains or gets this particular signal about the reset, it is going to start booting. So let us see what are the various steps involved when the CPU starts to boot. So we had seen the power on reset. Now when the power on reset comes and the CPU detects it, what happens is that every CPU register which is present inside the CPU is initialized to 0 except for 2 registers. And these registers are the code segment and the IP. Now when the reset occurs, the code segment is set to the value of 0xf000 and the instruction pointer is set to 0xfff0. So if you recollect how an 8088 or an 8086 processor uh, computes its address, it is going to take the code segment register in this case f followed by three zeros, shift it by four bits and add the instruction pointer. As a result, the physical address or the address for the first instruction to be executed will be present in f, 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 0. Now if you look up the RAM module and uh, which we had covered in the previous videos, what we would see is that the memory address corresponding to f, 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 0 would be pertaining to the BIOS area. In fact, this particular memory location is just 16 bytes below the 1 MB mark. So this particular thing 0 x 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that is 1 MB is this particular point or this particular address and the first physical address that is put on the address bus by the CPU is FFFF0 which is 16 bytes below this particular 1 MB mark. So as a result if you want to boot your system, it should be ensured that at this particular memory location we have a valid instruction which is present. So this point over here is the first instruction that is present. Now another thing what happens is that soon as the power is reset, 
the processor in is set to what is known as the real mode. So, in the real mode, the processor is in a backward compatibility mode with the 8088 or the 8086. So, recollect that the 8088 or 8086 processor could address at most 1 MB. So, it could address at most this part over here till this thing and this is shown as the green region in this RAM. There were other features of the real mode. They were no protection, no privilege levels, direct access to all memory and no multitasking. So, the first thing that the instructions over here in this particular location FFFF0 should do is to jump to a, an other location. So, essentially what would happen is that it would jump to a location in the BIOS and this jump would trigger the BIOS to start to execute. So, next we have that the BIOS ROM over here would begin to execute. So, as we know the BIOS is the basic input output system and it is a read only memory often these days it is in the form of a flash or E squared prom and you would actually notice a particular chip like this which is present on your system. So, some CPUs also display that particular BIOS name while booting up. For example, this particular chip is the AMI BIOS and it may get displayed while the system boots up. So, the BIOS uh, present in this particular area of the RAM will begin to execute code in real mode. So, the BIOS does the following essentially first does a power on self test where it checks the system for correctness. It ensures that all parts of the system are working properly. Next it initializes the video card and all other devices which are connected to the system. Then optionally it may display a BIOS screen on the monitor. Note that we have initialized the video card and therefore, the monitor is activated and it is capable of displaying things. So, the BIOS screen will now be able to display on the screen. Then it performs what is known as a memory test and sometimes some, some of the BIOSes also determine what memory is used and also the amount of memory that is present in the system. After the memory test, some parameters are set. For example, uh, these uh, correspond to the DRAM parameters and uh, the BIOS will ensure that various requirements of the DRAM such as the frequency at which the DRAM capacitors are refreshed are set adequately. Then plug and play devices are configured in the sense that all devices which are plug and play are going to be queried and the BIOS will then determine how much memory is required for each of these devices. And these devices are then allocated memory in the system. After that the BIOS would assign resources to DMA channels and the various IRQs that is the interrupt requests. From our perspective what is important is the next step where the BIOS identifies the boot device that is the device which most likely would hold the operating system. It would read the sector 0 from that boot device into the memory location 7C00. So, note that 7C00 is a memory location in the low memory region of the RAM. So, what it would do is it would copy the sector 0 which is typically of 512 bytes from the boot de device which is typically the hard disk into the memory location 7C00. So, at the location 7C00 we would have 512 bytes of code which would help in booting the operating system. The BIOS then causes a jump to 0x7C00. What it means is that the code present in 
location 7 C 0 0 which is present in the low memory of the RAM will begin to execute. Now, this memory the memory present in 7 C 0 0 and uh, copied from sector 0 of the hard disk into the RAM is known as the MBR or master boot record. So, this particular code is of 512 bytes out of which 446 bytes are instructions and contain bootable code about how to boot the system. There are 64 bytes uh, with which have information about the various partitions that are present on the disk. Essentially the 64 bytes are divided into 16 bytes per partition and then there are 2 bytes of a signature which is used to identify whether this is in fact an MBR code. So, this code begins to execute from the location 7 C 0 0 present in the RAM and what it typically does is that it is going to look into the partition table which is present and it is going to try to boot the operating system. So, essentially in order to do this it first loads what is known as the bootloader of the operating system. So, each operating system would have its own bootloader for instance Linux would have its own bootloader uh, or Windows would have its own bootloader and so on and optionally it may directly load the operating system by itself. So, we will see what happens in the bootloader code. So, after the MBR executes the bootloader would executes. So, the main job of the bootloader is that it loads the operating system. So, it, it optionally uh, like some operating systems that we, we see today, it may give an option to the user to select what operating system to load. The other jobs that are done by the bootloader is to disable interrupts, set up the GDP, GDT, switch from real mode to protected mode and read the operating system from the disk into the RAM. So, this these are the things which are done by the XV6 operating system. So, there may be slight variations when we go from one bootloader for one operating system to another operating system. Sometimes what may happen is that we do not have this MBR code present at all. In such a case the BIOS uh, or other in such a case the bootloader itself is present in the sector 0 of the hard disk and the BIOS will load the bootloader into the location 7 C 0 0 and jump to the bootloader. Essentially what is happening is we are skipping this particular MBR execution. So, once the bootloader executes and uh, sets up the processor and uh, the GDT and switching from real mode to protected mode, it would load the operating system from the disk. Now, the protected mode is a 32 bit mode essentially where we extend the memory region that can be accessed from 1 MB to the entire region of 4 gigabytes. So, we will not go into more details about how uh, this particular protected mode is activated and so on. So, once the bootloader loads the operating system, it then transfers control into the operating system and the operating system does several things like it sets up virtual memory. So, this includes setting up page directories and page tables so on. It initializes interrupt vectors uh, and the IDT interrupt descriptor tables and uh, the other aspects pertaining to interrupts. Then it initializes various devices present in the system like timers, uh, monitors, hard disk, consoles, uh, file systems and so on. Then it may also initialize other processors if they are present and finally, it would start up the first user process. So, in a future video we will see what the first user process is. So, this particular user process 
is the first process that executes in user space. So, you may recollect that all of this executes in the operating system and essentially this executes in the kernel space and it is only at this particular point during the boot up sequence will the user process start to execute. So, after this what is expected is that this first user process will spawn various jobs or user process jobs, various daemons and so on and one of its jobs is to create a shell. So, this shell would be then used by the user to run various programs and commands and so on. So, we will now look at systems which have a multiprocessor present in them. So, as we have seen in a previous video, so in the Intel type of architecture which have a, a multiprocessor present. So, the all processors share a front side bus and there on the front side bus there is a chipset or the north bridge which interfaces with the memory bus. So, essentially in this Intel type of architecture we have memory symmetry. So, what this means is that all processors in the system share the same memory space essentially in order to access a particular DRAM location all processors would need to send the same address to the DRAM. And the advantage of having such a symmetric view of the memory is that we can have a common operating system code which could execute in any of these processors. Similarly, there is what is known as the IO symmetry. Essentially, what this means is that all processors share the same IO subsystem. Essentially, all processors can receive interrupts from any IO device. Now, in order to boot a multiprocessor system, what is generally done is that one processor it is designated as the boot processor or the BSP. So, this designation is done either by setting a particular signal in the hardware or by the BIOS itself and all other processors are designated as application processors. So, when the system is powered on it is the only the boot processor which begins to execute. So, the BIOS will execute in the boot processor and that is the PSP and the BSP then learns about the system configuration. It determines how many other APs are there that is how many other application processors are present in the system and then it triggers the booting of the application processor. So, after it does all the initialization all the required initialization it would trigger the boot of the application processors. So, this triggering of the boot is done by something known as the startup IPI or the startup interprocessor interrupt. So, this is a signal from the BSP that is the boot processor to the application processor. So, when the application processors see this signal they will begin to boot and of course, they identify that they are not the main BSP, but rather the application processor. So, they skip various aspects such as initializing the various devices present in the system and so on. In this video, we had seen how the CPU boots right from the time the power on reset is provided to the processor to the point when the operating system begins to execute and spawns the first user process. In the later part of this course, we would see various aspects about how the operating system manages memory and manages different processes which are running in the system. Thank you.